<laughs> Good morning, friendship. Um, today's lesson is coming from 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 13. The topic of today's lesson is love never fails. Verse 1. Though I speak the tongues of men and angels and have no charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have no charity, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all goods to feed the poor and throw, I give my body to the burned, and I have no charity, it profits me nothing. Charity suffers long and is kind. Charity envieth not, charity vulnereth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not have itself unseemly, Seeketh not her own, it is not easily provoked, thinking no evil. Do not behave itself unseemly, rejoiceth in the iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail, whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when, we, when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly. But then face to face, no, I know, now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, and charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. As we look at 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3, it tells us clearly, no matter how many gifts of the Spirit we have, no matter how many languages we speak, if we aren't operating in love, all those gifts are useless. For example, if you're speaking in tongues and do not love, you're just making a lot of noise. According to Paul, we understand and interpret secrets and mysteries and have no love, then we're useless nobodies. Even if we give away all we have to the poor and we commit our lives and we do it out of and we don't do it out of love, then we gain absolutely nothing. Because the popularity of 1 Corinthians 13 in our present day, it's easy to miss the flexibility that Paul exercises concerning the triad. Now, when I speak of the triad, <clears throat> I'm speaking about faith, hope, and love. Um, 1 Corinthians 13 says these three, three things last forever, hope, faith, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Now, most people think Paul fixed this up with faith being first and love on the end and hope in the middle. But actually, Paul uses the triad in another scripture, but in a different configuration. It's important to see how he uses it and configures it because he tailors the triad to fix the community that he's addressing it to. For example, in 1 Thessalonians, the triad appears twice. In both instances, Paul placed them faith, love, and hope. And that was in 1 Thessalonians 1 and 3. And he says that we think of our faith, faithful work, your loving deeds, and enduring hope you have because of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul shifts this order because the Thessalonian church, they excelled in love, they excelled in faith, but they struggled in hope, especially in hope 
and their future. Accordingly, Paul puts emphasis on love being primary in 1 Corinthians 13 because the spiritual resource of the Corinthians lacks the most. Paul describes the work of love in both positive and in negative terms. Notice the characteristic of love. On the positive side, Paul says love is patient, is kind, selfless, not arrogant, not irritable, and involves truth-telling, courage, consistency, and tolerance. So when we love, we have to tolerate certain things. And it's got to be consistent. It can't be, I love you one day and I love you, kind of love you the next day. It has to be consistent. These things are possible when we put others before ourselves. Verses four through seven, what does love look like? A lot of us will look at love and say, it's a seasoned couple that's been married for 50 years. But that's not the um, love we're looking at. As Christians, we know that love is back on Calvary when our Savior died for us. That's the kind of love that Paul is explaining. He explains what love does and what it does not do. Biblical love is a decision. It's not just a feeling. It's a decision that we make. In terms of what love is not, Paul says, it is not self-seeking, short-tempered, arrogant. It's not offensive. We can't go around saying we love somebody and hurt their feelings at the same time. Love does not publicize someone's sin. Love does not quit and endures through thick and thin, the good times, the bad times. In other words, love does not hurt people. It does not hurt people. I remember my grandmother telling me that when I was younger, she gave me a whooping and she said, I'm doing this because I love you. And I, I never understood that kind of love. <laughs> but I got it. Verses 8 through 12. Love does not interfere with the presence of another's humanity. Love is the only means by which believers have a chance to live life fully in the knowledge and fellowship of God. All other spiritual gifts and human achievements provide limited access to that reality. You know, the awards that we receive, the attaboys, the pat on the backs, the pat on the heads, none of those, none of those equal up to God's love. Make no mistake, the love Paul is talking about here is not passive, it's not fluffy, it's not puffed up. This kind of love is up at dawn, Feet on the floor, tools in your hand, it's that working kind of love. It's that kind of love that builds communities. It nurtures positive social interactions and not just social networks, which many of us have come to prefer. Paul speaks about when perfect comes. All partials will come to an end. What is he talking about? Paul's referring to spiritual maturity. You know, a lot of times we look at love and we say, oh, that's the perfect love. In actuality, it's not a perfect love. It's partial. The only time we're going to see perfect love is when we see our Savior face to face. That's going to be that perfect love. When we're in God's presence. The more you grow maturity, the less you depend on insignificant gifts. 
Verses 11 through 12 says, we put a childish things aside. A child speaks and thinks and reasons like a child. But our goal is spiritual maturity. Um, I have a daughter. She's going to return 18 in a couple of days. And um, one of the conversations that I had with her last week was, you know, you're about to be 18, but that doesn't mean you're grown. And when we look at that, um, I got saved at 27. Just because I was an adult doesn't mean I matured, doesn't mean I was grown at that time. I had some growing to do. So, you know, when someone comes into the church and regardless of their age, we understand that they have maturing to do in Christ. Just because they're 40 or 30 or 20 doesn't mean that they're grown in Christ. When you reach a certain level of maturity, then you'll be able to experience the kind of love that Paul is referring to. Verse 13, of the triad, love is the greatest. It's clear in this chapter, walking in love should be our main focus. God is love, and he wants us to love one another. Paul's declaration of love unifies. In 1 Corinthians 1 and 5, love is the way by which we talk to each other. In 1 Corinthians 8, 13, love is the way we eat with one another. In 1 Corinthians 11 and 20, love shows us how to fellowship together, and affirm all. Now, when I say love shows us how to eat to eat with one another, I'm merely talking about if you know somebody can't eat a certain thing and you walking by them eating that all the time, that's not love. If we walk around speaking about somebody's imperfections, and how we speak to them, and we wake up every day mad at them. That's not love. Love, it forms whole and holistic people who are anchored in well-being of others. 1 Corinthians 16 and 14, love will not let us down if we do everything with love. Everything we do should be out of love. The word says, love God, love people. I pray, in closing, I pray that we'll become addicted to love, become addicted to walking in love and blessing people. Let's give Satan a nervous breakdown. Become radical in your love. Walk by asking the Lord to reduce me to love. Thank you.